Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh to all of my Muslim brothers and sisters and welcome to our guest and welcome to our at home viewers at One Oma TV uh, where we are simply trying to get the message of Islam out to as many people who are wanting and willing to listen. Um, we are broadcasting live tonight from College Station, Texas, the Augilan, they call it, correct? <laughs> broadcasting from Augilan. Um, not far north from Houston, Texas, which more people are probably familiar with Houston, Texas than College Station, uh, the home of Texas A&M University. And um, tonight we are going to discuss a very important topic, very important topic. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you I have all the answers, because I don't. I'm one person, I'm one human being. I don't have all the answers. But tonight we are going to discuss who does have all the answers and what is the reason for everything that we see around us including ourselves what is the purpose of life now that is a question that humanity has asked itself since the dawn of time itself why am I here what is my reason what is my purpose and this is a question that everyone has to answer for themselves at some point in their life in order to accomplish anything of benefit or value on a bigger scale. They need to know why am I here? What, what am I doing? And rather than discussing all of the viewpoints out there and whether or not we disagree with them, whether we agree with them, or trying to debate this viewpoint of the purpose of life versus this point of viewpoint of the purpose of life, I'm going to try to stick the majority of my talk to the Islamic perspective of the purpose of life, with maybe putting in some other viewpoints here and there for reference, but the, in, the, the majority is going to be about the Islamic viewpoint of the purpose of life. Now one thing I want to say that I have in common with almost everyone in this room, not only my Muslim brothers and sisters, but as well as our non-Muslim guests, is number one, I have in common with everyone that I am part of this race of humanity that is crawling across the face of the globe and even though now I'm sitting on one side of the fence as a Muslim not very long ago I was sitting on the other side of the fence as a non-Muslim uh, 13 years ago in 1998 I would not have been sitting here on this side of the fence I was sitting on that side of the fence and if you would have asked me what is the purpose of life I don't really think I would have been able to answer that with any credible certainty within inside of myself. What is the purpose of my life? And that was an answer that I was looking for and that was something that I was seeking and it also led me to be here where I am today. And one thing I'm going to ask everyone tonight is to have an open mind. Have an open mind even if you have some conceived notion of what you believe the purpose of life is. I also ask you to just open your mind for a moment. Because they say the mind is like a parachute. Can anyone tell me how the mind is like a parachute? How does a parachute work? If it's open, right? A parachute only works if it's open. You jump out of an airplane and don't open a parachute, it's not going to do you very good. The parachute only works if it is open. So the open mind will let the mind work. Also, the water in the glass analogy. If you take a glass and you turn it upside down and you try to pour water into it, how far will you get? Will you be able to fill that glass? Never. You'll never be able to fill the glass. I don't care if you pour all day long. You're never going to fill not even a drop in the glass. The glass needs to be turned over and to be a receptacle for receiving the water. So I'm asking you to at least have an open mind tonight to not accept the ideas. I'm not forcing you to accept ideas, but at least be open to receive them. At least be open to receive them. Now, this question, the purpose of life, one of the reasons is so important, and one of the reasons it is a question that has been debated throughout the ages, and one thing that I think has prevented a lot of people from answering this question are the implications behind it. The implications behind answering this question. Because if I answer the question for myself, what is the purpose of my life, then that would lead for me to have to do something about it. If I realize the purpose to my life, 
I have to do something about that. Then, then I would have to act upon that purpose. And what if I decide that the purpose of my life, or if I find out the purpose of my life, is something completely different than I have always known, or something that I have always held as a value, or something that my parents have taught me, or something maybe that my teachers have taught me, or a pastor has taught me, or whoever has taught me. What if I find out, by asking this question sincerely, something that different than I've ever known? That means that I would have to change. My ideas have to change. My life has to change. Everything about me is going to change revolving around that purpose. And one thing, if human beings are afraid of anything, we're afraid of change. Change is frightening. Change is very frightening, especially when it's major change. And there could be no more major change than answering for yourself, what is the purpose of my life? And when it comes to purpose, purpose what is a purpose in and of itself? Purpose is a reason, and reason for, a reason to. If you have no purpose in your life, then you have no reason to continue to get up every morning. Everyone lives their life with a purpose whether or not they know it. Whether or not they've answered that question for themselves, they are living their lives according to a purpose. You get out of the bed in the morning, right? Everyone here gets out of the bed in the morning, correct? If you get out of the bed in the morning, you have a reason for getting out of the bed in the morning, correct? You don't just automatically jump and get out of the bed and say, mm, I, I, involuntarily. You get up for a reason. Most of you, you get up to go to school, right? You get up, I have to go to school, I have to go to class, I have to go to work, I have to make a paycheck. Even if you get up like me some mornings, I crawl out of the bed sometimes, I think, just to get a good cup of coffee. Whatever it is, you're getting up for a reason. You go to work for a reason. You go to school for a reason. You continue to live your life for a reason. But maybe you have not pinpointed it yet. Maybe you haven't well defined that reason. Maybe your reason is always changing. Right now your reason may be to go to school. Later on your reason may be to go get a job and to go to work. Later on your reason might change. So our reasons for getting up, our reasons for living might change. But one thing that is very beautiful about Islam is that the Muslim is taught to fine-tune that reason. Fine-tune that reason to a central point, to where everything I'm doing in my life, whether it's going to school, whether it's going to work, whether it's getting up just to pray, whatever it is, I'm getting up with one central focus, one central reason, one central purpose do I do everything in my life. And everything in my life revolves around that hub of purpose. And the Muslim is taught to fine tune that. And that starts at the age when we begin to understand the world around us. And that purpose and that reason for doing things continues until the day we meet our death. The inevitable resting place of all human beings. You know, as they say, life is all about from the womb to the tomb. We are all racing towards death. Every single day you are racing towards your death. Every breath you take, every single moment that passes, you are racing towards your eventual end. None of us are immortal. We are finite beings. So when someone fine-tunes their purpose and their reason, they become a much more productive individual. When you look at people who are ultimately successful in the world, let's just take the business world. If you look at people like the Bill Gates of the world, the Steve Jobs of the world, the Warren Buffetts of the world, if you ask them what gets you out of bed in the morning, they will snap right immediately and tell you. They'll give you a reason. What gets me out of bed in the morning? What made you continue to do what you were doing even though your company almost tanked? What made you overcome this hurdle? What made you do this? And all of these questions you will get almost a similar response because these people have fine-tuned a purpose for their life. Even if that purpose was just to make technology help people in their lives and to make communication better. Or maybe if it was just to make their wallets fatter or whatever it was, those things drove them. And they worked on it so much and they drove them so much that hurdles that were put in front of them didn't phase them. Setbacks in their companies didn't phase them. People coming against them didn't phase them. Other companies that would come and rival them or in competition didn't phase them because they had a purpose. And that purpose continued to be in front of them all the time. Let me give you an analogy to this purpose question. Let's say we went to run a race. What's the major highway? What's one of the major highways near here? 76? 76? Six. six. Highway 6, just 6? Let's say they set up, they block off Highway 6. 
and we go and we all line up for this race, you know, we're ready, we're pumped up, we get our everything going, and we ask, you know, how long is the race? And they say, oh, the race is 10 kilometers, 26, or if you want a marathon at 26.2. You know, they put the point two there because anybody can run 26, it's those point two. <laughs> anyway, they say it's this long. Now, if it's 10 kilometers and you begin to run, we're all running, correct? And we get to the ninth kilometer and we start to get tired. You start to get fatigued, or you get a cramp in your side, or your leg starts to hurt, or you get dehydrated. Now, you're almost there. What are most people going to, what are most people going to do in this situation? They're going to push through the pain. They're going to push through it. They're going to make it to the end. Why? Because they know, I'm trying to get to that 10th kilometer. I'm trying to get to that finish line. They have that finish line in mind, and they're going to get there. Cramp, no cramp. Thirsty, no thirsty. Leg hurting, no leg hurting. We've been, even, you've even seen some runners just completely, their body just fall apart. And they would drag themselves across the finish line because they know where they're wanting to go. The race has a purpose, correct? Yes or no? Now, what if we go out and begin and we ask, okay, how long is the race? I'm ready to go. They say, what do you mean how long is it? There's no end. You just run. We're just running. All right. Most people, right then, thank you very much, I'm going back home. Right? There's no point to this race. And for those who decide to run this race, if you get to that 8 kilometer, 9 kilometer, 10 kilometer, and you get that cramp and pain and, and thirst, what are you going to do? You're going to stop. Why? Because there's no point to continue to go on. There's no reason for me to push through this pain. There's no reason for me to continue to hurt myself. Because there is no end to this race. And so in the race of life, if you have a purpose, then you have a reason to keep going on. If you have a bad day, you get up in the morning again. Right? Even if I had a bad day yesterday, it doesn't mean I'm going to not get up this morning. No, I'm going to continue on because I have a reason for getting up in the morning. When you, when you have class in the morning, if you have a headache, don't you go to class? Nine times out of ten? Yeah, you go to class. If you're tired, you got to go to class. Even if you're sick sometimes, you got to go to class. Because you have a purpose for getting up. you got to go to work. you got to make that paycheck. Paycheck's not going to come with me laying in this bed. So you have a reason that you get up and push on. But for someone who has no purpose in life, they lose complete purpose of life. These are people who end up committing suicide. These are why people will commit suicide. People commit suicide because they give up. The pain or something becomes so unbearable that they don't see a reason to push through it. There is nothing on the other side for me. I just give up on life. They lose focus of purpose. People become addicted to drugs and alcohol and all other types of vices because they have no real purpose in life. And their purpose becomes to find themselves at the bottom of a bottle. Or their purpose becomes to down a bottle of pills or to get high, or whatever it is, that becomes their purpose. They want to give their life a reason. And if they don't have a reason, they find a reason. And normally those reasons are, become vices, they become addictions, they become cancers upon society. So can all of you begin to see the difference between having a purpose in life and not having a purpose in life? Whatever it is, you must have a purpose in order for you to accomplish things. And if you haven't defined that purpose, I'm going to tell you, there's no better time than now to figure out what is your purpose in life. And what are you doing here? Now, if we look at the world around us, if we just stop for a moment, I know our lives are so hectic and busy that we don't really, you know, take the advantage of, of, of admiring what is around us anymore. And as a student of psychology, this is one of the things that I have come to very clearly see is that our lives of this fast-paced, on-the-go lifestyle, our life of multitasking, I really think there should be a course on multitasking in college now. I mean, that really should be a beginner course, multitasking 101, because you need to almost be able to do 10 things at once to accomplish anything in life anymore. I mean, we are, we are so addicted to technology and things of that nature. We're text messaging, we're emailing, we're IMing, boom, boom, things are going and firing at such a rapid pace that studies have shown that people take very few deep thoughts anymore. Our minds are scrambled, our thoughts are jargoned, we, we think like we live, multitasking things. If you ever want to find out how crazy your mind is running, just go up for a moment in a quiet room, sit down, be quiet, and be cognizant of your thoughts. Just be aware of what your mind is thinking about. 
involuntarily, you'll start to realize, oh my God, there are so many things going on up in the air. I don't know how I get anything done. And that's just how society has become. People take very seldom chances and take very few occasions to sit down and reflect upon anything. One thing and just focus on it and reflect. If we were to take a moment and reflect on the world around us and the creation of the universe at large, and I am going to talk to you from a creationist perspective. Creationist perspective. If we look at the world around us, everything has a purpose. Everything within the heavens and the earth has a purpose. This world has a purpose. Air that we breathe, the way it comes to us, it's there for a purpose. If it wasn't there, we wouldn't be here. The sun has a purpose. The moon itself has a purpose. Without that moon, we're not here. The way the earth is positioned to rotate around the sun has a purpose. Without that earth being positioned right where it is, we wouldn't be here. Nothing would be here. Everything has a purpose around it. And for someone to say that this entire system of the universe and its greatness and the things that we don't even understand of yet, but what we can grasp and even what is around us, what is in this earth, what is in the human body, for someone to say that is all a system of random chance, that is all a system of random chance, or to put it technically, a random set of coincidences. A random set of coincidences happened so that everything that is could come into being. That would basically mean that everything that exists right now exists for no purpose whatsoever. That is the equation of that statement. For me to stand here and say everything that exists right now is due to a random set of circumstances and coincidences is for me to say this earth, this world, this universe has no purpose whatsoever. And that really is a very pessimistic outlook on life. Because were that to be the case, we are sitting on a great gambling scheme. Because for a random set of coincidences for happen like this, is just as easy, and this has been used many times before this equation, but I'm going to repeat it because of how beautiful it is. Anybody here gone through advanced calculus? Theories of probability? Raise your hands. Okay, so you should be able to answer this for me. And you've probably heard this before. This, if you were to take a bag, a small bag, plastic bag, paper bag, whatever it is, where you can't look inside of it, and you put numbered balls, one through 10, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Numbered balls. And you put them in that bag. Shake the bag up. Blindfold yourself or just close your eyes. Reach down in that bag. Pull out number one. Set it on the table. Reach down in the bag. Without looking. Pull out number two. Set it on the table. Reach down in the bag. Pull out number three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Just like that. What is that probability? Can anybody tell me the probability that I can pull those ten balls out in order? No, no, the chance, the probability. One in around 27 million. One in 27 million. That's the probability that I have to be able to do that. And that's just 10 balls in a bag. So what kind of probability are we looking at? To say that this entire creation, the way it is set up right now, for the earth to be exactly where it needs to be, for the sun to be exactly how it needs to be, as hot as it needs to be, as bright as it needs to be, for the moon to be exactly where it needs to be, for the amount of air in this atmosphere exactly what it needs to be, the amount of water that evaporates and disperses itself exactly the way it needs to be, our bodies constructed exactly the way they need to be to be able to live on this earth. What type of probability do you think we're looking at? It's not quantifiable, right? That theory is not quantifiable. There is no calculus, there is no calculation, there is no math that you can do to put that probability forward. But people who will say this life is here by random chance instead of circumstances, they are taking that risk. That is all here by that chance of probability. That there was some bang at the beginning of, I don't know how they can even say the beginning, because if it's all just probably chance, but there was some bang and then all of a sudden molecules started floating around and they just happened to go where they needed to go for everything to be how it is today. Let me tell you something. 
If there was a big bang, the moment that bang happened, every single atom, every single particle, every single molecule knew its place. For this to be how it is right now, everything had to know its place. It had to know exactly where it needed to be. It had to know exactly where it needed to go. And that is only by design. That can only happen by design. You do not get this type of perfect harmony of the universe by destruction, such as like a big bang that, that just leads to nothing. And if you want to see that marvel happening before your very eyes, how many of you, if you could see the, if you could see the act of creation happening, how many of you would love to do so? If you could see the act of, of the universe coming together, how many of you would like to do that? You can do that, can you not? How many of you here have taken astronomy, advanced astronomy, etc.? Are there not nebulas way out in space that we can look at? That there are still remnants of that beginning dust particles and smoke particles where stars are still forming, galaxies are still forming, things are still falling into place. The creation process is still continuing to happen. And for you to take a look at that and say that's happening all by itself, randomly, probably, by probability, by just some set of circumstances, is almost irrational for an intelligent human being to come up with. But unfortunately, this is a theory that has been put forward. But most people, most people, I will give them, and all of you, I will give you the benefit of the doubt that your capacity, the capacity of your mind to reflect, to analyze, to deduce logical conclusions, will lead you to see that there is something bigger than just some random chance. All of this that we see around us is bigger than just some random chance. The fact that, the fact that birds can migrate great distances and travel even on cloudy days just by seeing how the sun reflects and the way it angles off the clouds, those birds know exactly where to go that bees can travel from their hives hundreds and hundreds of miles. Hundreds and hundreds of miles. No Tom Tom, no GPS, no nothing. No Google Maps. Go exactly where they need to go to get what they need and make it directly back to their hive. Even if there's a hundred hives in the field, they'll go right back to theirs. And then they will tell everybody else, look, there's stuff out there. To say that that happens by chance. The fact that salmon are able to at the end of their life when they're ready to spawn, they can trace their lineage all the way back upstream, up river, up waterfalls, all the way back to the place where they were born by the sense of smell in order to begin that reproduction process again. I think all of you, I will give you the benefit of the doubt, you can say that that is something bigger than some random set of coincidences. There is something bigger going on behind this. There is somebody behind the scenes with this. If you were to walk out and let's say they built a brand new, glorious bridge somewhere here in Texas or in Houston. I don't know if there's water here in College Station, but let's say in Houston, they built some new, huge, glorious bridge, biggest bridge in the world, most luxurious bridge in the world. When you went and looked at that bridge, you would marvel at its design. You would be like, wow, look at this great structure. You would think about the person who designed this. How amazing a mind of an architect must it have been to make this. Your first thought wouldn't be, wow, I wonder how all of that just fell together. That's amazing. Steel just started, you know, falling all over the place. Concrete was just flowing from the sky and, you know, it just happens. That would not be your first thought. Your first thought would be, how amazing is it that an individual like the human being could come up with something like this? Or the very famous watch in the desert idea. If you were walking in a desert and you found a nice watch, you know, very fancy watch, Citizen, Bolivar, whatever want to have you, you would pick it up and you would first think to yourself, how did this get here? How, how did this get here? Who left this here? You wouldn't think that, wow, that is amazing that over all of this time, sand came together and started graining and forming glass and this is not what the human mind would start comprehending. You would know someone left this here. Yes or no? 
This is the logic of the rational human mind. So, and that's, I'm talking about a watch. A simple piece of glass and metal. What about this beautiful world that we live on? This beautiful earth, this beautiful universe that's ever expanding. The, the theory goes that the world is, the, the universe is continuing to expand. What's beyond its borders? Who knows? And then it will expand so much one day that they theorize that it will eventually implode in on itself. It will get so large that it will just overcome itself. To say that that all is just there by some random set of circumstances is not logical or rational or befitting the human capacity to understand and think. To understand and think. Now, let's just go down, let's, let's boil it down a little bit more. Let us look at the human itself. Take a look at yourself for a moment. Just think about yourself for a moment. Think about the design of the human being. Think about the mind, the brain that is contained inside of this cranium of ours. How this brain is able to store so much information. How it is able to just fire off the synap the, the synap nodes and the 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 um, uh, the architecture that's going on firing information at a millionth of a second over and over every single moment of your life. Think about the capacity of the human brain to take in the world around it, the way it is able to dissect information that is being given to it and feed that information throughout the body, how it's able to receive information from the body and recalculate itself accordingly, how we're able to react to things without thinking, how the mind controls everything that we do. Think about that for a moment. Think about the human eye, just the simple human eye, the greatest camera that has ever existed. The way the human eye processes information, the way it knows how to filter how much light in and out, how to take the, 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 the light that is around it, the colors and all of the different things that are being fed into it and how it is able to translate that and send that information up to the brain to allow us to comprehend what is in front of us, to comprehend what is around us. Think about the heart that is inside the human body. When does it start beating? Can anybody tell me when the heart starts beating? Come on, some of you anatomy students. When does the human heart start beating? 40 days. At around 40 days? 120? Getting some... Some people will even say it begins almost right after conception. As soon as the heart forms, it begins to beat. As soon as the heart forms, it starts beating. And it beats continuously, non-stop. Day in, day out. It doesn't take a day off. It doesn't take a break. It doesn't take a minute off. What happens when it takes a minute off? You're dead. It does not stop beating until you die. And it beats without the will of the one whom it's inside of. Does your heart beat to your own will? If that were the case, a lot of us, we would all be dead. You would have to continually think every day, okay, beat, beat, do no, do no, do no. You wouldn't be able to do anything else. It beats without your own willpower. And it's continually fueling the body with blood. Continuing to pump that blood and send that blood through the body over and over and over and over and over and over again. Did that happen by a set of random circumstances? Did that begin by a drop of bacteria in the ocean? And over millions of years it just designed itself? Think about the liver. The liver for a moment. The liver is an amazing organ inside the body. Without it, you can't live. The liver, every single moment, is performing hundreds and hundreds of chemical analysis of what's going through your body. And it is deciding what the level of toxicity of the body should be at. And it is filtering and letting go through it and filtering what it needs to filter and let go through it, what it needs to let go through to make sure the level of toxicity in the body stays regulated. When the liver stops functioning, the toxicity increases in the body until one dies. Who designed that? That was another random set of circumstances. Look at the nervous system of the human body. The nervous system of the human body and the amount of of cords that are running out throughout our entire system to give us the, the, the feelings of touch, of taste. 
Did that come by a random set of circumstances too? We're building up a lot of random circumstances here. And again, you cannot even begin to quantify a theory of probability that could say that these things could happen on their own. On their own. So surely, surely, all of this has to be for a reason. All of this has to be for a reason. The universe has to be for a reason. The sun, the moon, the stars, the planets, the earth, the air, the water, you, your brain, your eyes, your heart, your liver, it all has to be for a reason. It's there for a purpose. So what is that purpose? Surely we have to say, my life has some meaning. We should be able to leave here tonight, every one of us to say, my life has a meaning. It has a meaning. I live my life because of that meaning. And what is that meaning? Is the meaning of our life just to enjoy? Live, eat, drink, sleep, be merry? As the hedonists would say, is our life all about hedonism where we're just enjoying everything we can get our hands on at any moment, at any time, at any place? If that's the case, then life is for some and not others. If life is all about gaining, getting money, gaining wealth and property and things of that nature, then life is for some and not others. Do you think my five-year-old son cares if he has $500 in his bank account? Do you think he cares? Do you think he cares if he has $1 in his bank account? $5,000 in his bank account? No. As long as he has his ice cream and cake and candies and his PSP, he's good to go. He doesn't need anything else. He could care less about that fancy car that I have in the driveway. He could care less about that big house. It doesn't make any difference to him. What about a person who is blind? Is just enjoying the luxuries of the beauty of around the world. Is, is, is that for him too? So is it for some and not others? What about the paraplegic? If life is all about just eat, drink, and be merry, enjoying, and all of these carnal pleasures, what about the person who is a paraplegic who can't move anything? So is life for some and for not others? Is this the system that we are willing to accept? That life is for some and for not others? It's for the haves and for the have-nots? Sorry. This just wasn't your life. This wasn't for you. Surely every single one of our lives has purpose. From the five-year-old child, to the paraplegic, to the blind, to the deaf, to the disabled. Surely everyone's life has a purpose. If we were to say that life is only about enjoying these pleasures, then for someone like the paraplegic, the only recourse for them would be, we'll just, we'll just euthanize them. Why not? Why not? There's no point. Just give up. Look, just, just, just drink this. Just, just, just end it for yourself. Quit putting yourself through all of this misery. For someone who can't see, look, there's nothing left for you in this life. You know, just, just, just go ahead and end it. There's no, there's no reason for you to continue this on. This would be the idea that we're presenting to the world. That if life is all about enjoying, then for those who can't enjoy, just give up. Just give up. But no one would logically say that this is rational. Matter of fact, you go around doing this, I guarantee you're going to jail. You're going to jail. You start euthanizing people, you're going to jail. So, what does Islam have to say about all of this? To make the story sum up short, because in 10 minutes we're going to have to break, because it's going to be time for prayer. And then after prayer, we're going to simply discuss and continue about what is Islam and what, are, what does Islam really mean and say about this subject. One thing that I want to be very clear about Islam, very, very clear. Islam is not an abstract. Again, Islam is not an abstract idea. What do I mean by abstract? Can anybody tell me? Come on, this is interactive. I don't like to just be lecturing. Interactive. What is an abstract? What is an abstract idea? It's up to interpretation. It's up to interpretation. It's up to the eye, it's in the eyes of the beholder, as they say. Islam is not an abstract idea. Islam is a way of life, a set rule of principles that are given to us by the creator of all of this grand design through what he has given to his creation. 
Islam is not what you see on CNN. Islam is not what you will find on Fox News. Islam is not what you read in Times Magazine. Okay, again, Islam is not an abstract idea. Islam is a way of life based upon principles that the Creator has sent to us through His many prophets and messengers. And we as Muslims believe in all the prophets and messengers. We believe that we came all from one human being, Adam, our forefather, and his mate, Eve. We believe in Noah. We believe in Abraham. We believe in Moses. We believe in David. We believe in Zechariah. We believe in Jesus. And we believe in the last and final messenger, Muhammad. Peace be upon them all. We believe that God has given a set way of life to human beings. And this way of life to human beings has always been the same. It has always been the same. And it has always defined human beings, not only way of life, but their purpose of life. And I haven't even told you, finite, definite, what the purpose of life is in Islam. We're getting to that. That comes at the end. Islam is something that is being talked about almost on every single media outlet throughout the world. Islam is being talked about. Islam is being talked about in the major magazines, the major newspapers, the periodicals, the blogs, the websites. Islam is on the forefront of discussion and ideas and has been for over a decade now. Ever since 9-11, we all know, since the tragedy of 9-11, Islam has been on the forefront of the world scene. And one very sad fact about that is that that narrative of what Islam is has been in the hands of people who do not know what Islam is. Islam, what Islam is, has been in the hands, and that narrative has been in the hands of people who have no idea what Islam is. Because we've heard so many varying ideas about what Islam is. Islam is this, Islam is that. One day it's this, the next day it's that, the next day it's this. Islam is not an abstract, it doesn't change. It is not up to interpretation, it's not change according to the time and date and period and place. Islam is one thing, and that's what we're going to finish with tonight. Islam is an Arabic word. It's an Arabic word. Coming from a root system. For those of you who know Semitic languages, Semitic languages come from a root system. The grammar comes from a root system. Islam comes from a root word, Salama. Salama, S-L-M. Salama. Salama has many different meanings. It has different connotations. Now a lot of people will tell you this land means peace. Islam means just peace. Yes and no. That's not the complete picture. That's not just. Because Islam does mean peace, but that is an end idea. That is an end idea. Islam also means submission. Submission, meaning that I submit myself to something. I am being suburbiant to something. Salama. It also means sincerity. Being sincere towards something. Having sincerity towards something, whether it's an idea, or whatever it is. Sincerity. It also means obedience. Being obedient to something. I am obedient to something. And then it also means peace. <coughs> Islam simply means, if you want to put it in the English language. Islam means that I submit myself to the one who created me. I submit myself to the one who created me with sincerity, with sincerity, in obedience to him, so that I can have peace in my life, and I can have peace in the next life. This is Islam. And this is all that Islam is. Again, Islam means, I submit myself to the one who created me. In obedience to him means I do what he wants me to do. I stay away from what he wants me to stay away from. With, with great depth of obedience to obtain peace in this life and peace in the next. That is Islam. Anything other than this is not Islam. Now, did I bring up the word terrorism in that definition? 
Did anybody hear me use the word terrorism? It's a question. No, right? So is, is, is Islam terrorism? No. That's an oxymoron. It's an oxymoron. You guys know what an oxymoron means, right? Two statements that you try to put together, which are actually in complete, complete opposite or complete difference to one another. Did I say Islam is oppression? Did I mention oppression in this definition? Did I mention oppression in this definition? No. Islam is only submission to the Creator with sincerity and obedience to Him to obtain peace in this life and the next. That's it. And that is something that I'm trying to be very upfront about, is that if we Muslims tell the world what Islam is, simply, plainly, clearly, and we talk about the issues that are being talked about, we talk about them on our terms, from our narrative, from the revelation that God has given to humanity, and from what He has taught us, then we would get rid of a lot of these negative connotations and negative ideas. So, within that definition, for someone to say, Islamic extremists, Islamic extremists, did I mention extremism in that idea, in, in, in that definition anywhere? No. So Islamic extremist is also an oxymoron. Because you cannot be extreme in Islam. You cannot be extreme in Islam because it doesn't fit within the definition. Do you see what I'm trying to get you to grasp? You can't put inside that definition what doesn't fit. A, an Islamic radical doesn't fit. It won't fit. It doesn't fit with the definition of someone who is submitting themselves with sincerity and obedience to the Creator to have peace in this life and the next. It won't fit. This is what Islam is. What is a Muslim? We hear all the time, Muslims, Muslim this, Muslim that. Nobody knows what a Muslim means. And let me tell you for benefit of our non-Muslim guests, because even I find Muslims, get to, they tend to use this word a lot because it's used, and, and I, and I want to get us away from this. You guys have heard it called Muslim before, right? Muslims, or Muslims. Please don't use this word. I'm asking you, please don't use this word. This word has very negative connotation. And it's for a reason. Can anybody tell me what the word Muslim means? An oppressor. It means someone who oppresses people, someone who harms people. It also comes from a root word, but it's not S-L-M. It's Z-L-M. Zulm. Zulm means to harm or to wrong or to oppress people. So when you say, if I call myself, oh yes, I'm a Muslim. I hope not. <laughs> I hope not. I am a Muslim. Mus Lim. Muslim means very simply, and I'm going to let you define it for yourself. I'm going to a little grammar lesson here. And honestly, I'm going to tell you, I know more about Arabic grammar than I do about English grammar. It's just unfortunate, but it's the fact. I'm from the South. Our grammar is completely different. Um, in English, we have something that you put at the end of a word to denote action, correct? If you want to denote action for a particular thing, like for instance, I'm talking, right? If I wanted to know that I'm doing action, I would be called a talk er. er. What is that called in grammar? The ER at the end. Man, you guys are bad. <laughs> <laughs> at the end, it's a suffix that denotes action. If I walk, I'm a walk er. Correct? You put ER on the end, it denotes action, correct? You take the verb, you put the E-N on the uh, E-R on the end, it denotes the doer of action, correct? And out of there is a very similar rule. Similar rule, except that it is a prefix that goes at the beginning of a word. For instance, that, that prayer, that, that call that you just heard for prayer. Do you know what is that called? What is it called? The Avan. The Avan. And the one who calls it is called the Mu'adhan. The way you denote action in the Arabic language is you put a M, an M at the beginning of the word, just an M. You put an M at the beginning of the word, you put a little vowel, U, and you denote action. Mu denotes one who does. One who does, correct? Come on, you guys. Am I wrong, right? Yes, no, give me something. So, the Adhan, the one who calls it is called the Mu Adhan, Mu Adhan. So, if we take Islam, 
which means, and it is a verb as well, it means to submit myself to the Creator with sincerity, in obedience to Him, to obtain peace in this life and the next. And I want to denote that action of a doer. I put that in you at the beginning of it. What does it become? Mu-Islam, or if you put it together, Muslim. Muslim means someone who does Islam. Very simply. Someone who does Islam. A Muslim is someone who submits themselves to their Creator every single day of their lives in sincerity to Him, in obedience to Him, to have peace in this life and the next. So, Muslim fundamentalists, can I mean Muslim radical, can exist. You can be fundamentally Muslim, yes, absolutely. Muslim extremists, Muslim terrorists, Muslim whatever you want to call it, if it doesn't fit in with the definition, it will not work. It will not work. And I'm giving these things to you as gently as I can so that you can see when you hear people talk about Islam, you can use your own barometer whether they're telling the truth or not, whether they're being honest or not. Because a lot of the times they're not being honest. This is what Islam means. And this is the purpose of life in Islam. The purpose of, the, of life in Islam, the reason why we are here, the reason God created us and placed us on this earth was to submit ourselves to Him every day of our lives with sincerity in obedience to Him to have peace in this life and in the next life. Does this sound familiar to any of our guests? Does this way of life sound familiar to any of you? This is the way of life God had for Adam. This is the way of life God had for Noah. This is the way of life God had for Moses. This is the way of life God had for Abraham. This is the way of life God had for David. This is the way of life Jesus lived. He lived a life being submissive to God. He lived a life trying to please the Father who is in heaven. He lived a life to have peace in this one. And He tried to bring peace to humanity in the next life. This is simplistically the purpose of life in Islam. And does that mean I have to stand and pray all day to fulfill that purpose? Does it, brothers? No. How do I fulfill that purpose in life? To please my Creator with every single thing that I do in obedience to Him with sincerity and worship Him. There's a verse in the Quran that very clearly states the purpose of life. Sums it up. And it comes in Surah 51. And in Arabic, which is the pristine language of the Quran, because even when I tell you a translation of the Quran, that's not the Quran. It's a translation of meanings. It says very clearly, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I did not create humanity. I did not create people with willpower to do right and wrong except for one reason. And that is to worship me. That is to worship me. That is simply to worship me. And that doesn't mean I have to be standing in prayer all day long. Because even the Bible says to pray without ceasing. But that doesn't mean you have to sit in your room all day praying and praying and praying. And praying. You have a life to live. What does it mean? It means that everything I do in my life fits in with that purpose. It fits in with that purpose. I'm doing it in submission to my Creator in obedience to Him with sincerity to Him. If I go to work in the morning, it's not to bring a paycheck home at the end of the week, brothers, for my Muslim brothers and sisters. I go to work in the morning, why? Because it is pleasing to my Creator for me to go and earn my living in a permissible way. And it is a good thing for me to do and God is pleased with it. When I do that, my work becomes worship. My work becomes worship of God even if my work is sweeping streets. Even if it's picking up trash around the university. That work becomes worship to God because I'm doing it in submission to Him, trying to please Him with my effort. That is what we mean by fine-tuning your reason in life. Dialing in that purpose that when I wake up in the morning, the reason I get out of bed is because I want to please my Creator today. I want to make the one who created the happy with me. I go to school because I want to be educated, because that pleases the one who created me. That will help me to get a better job, so that I can sustain myself better, which will please the one who created me. So I can have my family have better than I had. That is pleasing to my Creator. Do you understand what I mean? So, brothers, when you think that you go to work just for a paycheck, and you go home, and things are not right in your house, and you start, I put the food on the table and this, and I pay the light bills, and your wife should look at you and say, you're out of your mind. If you think that the one who created me cannot take care of me without you, then you're fooling only you. 
If you think the Creator can't take care of your family without you, then you're fooling no one but you. Because He created everything and He takes care of it. The word Lord, the word Lord, Adonai, whatever you want to call it, means the one who sustains. The one who caretakes of His creation. He caretakes of His creation perfectly. And in gratitude to that, we submit our wills to Him. This is the beauty of Islam to me, is how clearly it defines life. How many of you in here have a free will? You can do whatever you want. If you don't all put your hands up in here, then we're going to have to start scanning people to see if we have any sci-fi robots with us. Because <laughs> you all have a free will. You can do whatever you want. You came here of your own volition. Right? What Islam teaches us, the meaning of life is, that yes, the Creator gave us a free will to do what we wish. But in order to be a Muslim, what I do is I take that free will that He gave me and I give it back. I give it back and say, I don't want to do my will anymore because when I try to do it myself, I make a lot of mistakes. I can't figure it all out on my own. So we return that will to our Creator and say, now I want you to tell me what to do. I want you to tell me what to do. You created me. You put me here. So well, tell me what to do. And in that, God has sent His prophets and messengers to guide humanity the right way of life. And we submit to that. And that makes us Muslim. So Muslim doesn't mean somebody who was born in Saudi Arabia. Muslim doesn't mean somebody who wears a dress every day, who has a big beard. A Muslim means someone who submits themselves to their Creator. So let me ask you a question. The sun, that this, that this um, solar system revolves around, is that sun doing what it's supposed to do? Does it take a day off? Does it decide, you know what, today I'm, I'm, I'm tired of this whole giving life thing. Take a day off. Does it do what it's supposed to do? Does it submit itself to the one who created it? So it is a Muslim. According to definition, the sun is a Muslim. The moon is a Muslim. Air is a Muslim. It does what it is designed to do. It doesn't take a day off. It doesn't say, you know what God, I'm no more. Nah, no. I'm not going to be helping these people out anymore. I'm going to go out and just void myself in space. Right? Gravity, one of the laws of creation, is a Muslim. Gravity is a Muslim because it fits the definition of something that is submitting itself to its creator and fulfilling its role. This is the meaning of life in Islam, for us to fall in line. Fall in line! For what goal, what purpose? Why do I give my will back to my creator? Because I am making a transaction. And in that transaction, God says in the Qur'an, translated to mean, Rejoice in the transaction that you have made. What is that transaction? I return that will to my Creator so that I can have paradise in the next life. It's a very simple transaction. A very profitable transaction, to be honest with you. I don't have to figure out my life anymore. I don't have to try to make sense of it all. I take what God has given me. I accept that. And in exchange, in the next life, forever and ever, I get paradise, eternal bliss. That's a transaction, that's a deal, if you ask me. This is the purpose of life in Islam. Very simply, just to fall in line with the creation. Do what we were created to do. And the most beautiful of that creation is the human being. Because the human being is the only thing that the Creator created that can make a choice. The sun doesn't make a choice. The moon doesn't make a choice. Animals don't make choices. We make choices. And that, what is, that is what makes us the greatest of His creation, or we can become the worst of His creation. And there's everything along that spectrum. Someone who turns back to their Creator and gives them back that will, they are called a Muslim. And this is as simple as it gets. So how many people in here would agree with me that everything here is for a purpose? If you don't agree with me, I, I, I'm fine with that. That everything that exists is there for a reason. Hands up. If you agree with that, you agree with that. I would say that's a majority. How many of you would say that rational logic would tell me that if there is a purpose, I should know what it is? I should know what it is. Good. So I want you to leave here tonight 
thinking about the things you have heard tonight. That there is a reason. Your life has meaning. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you've been through. Your life has meaning. And it has great meaning. It has great importance. And the most beautiful gift that you can ever give yourself in your life is to figure out what that is. To figure out what the meaning of your life is. To figure out why you're here. What are you doing? And then live your life according to that meaning. That is the greatness of, of humanity. That is what can make humanity so great. But when we lose grasp of that, when we lose sense of that, we live in chaos. And we live in a world that has lost focus on why it's here. We live in a world where humanity has lost its reason. We've lost purpose. Because someone who will tyrannize another individual, they have lost their purpose. They've lost reason. They, they've lost focus. Someone who will murder another person, they've lost focus, they've lost purpose, they've lost reason. We have to come back to this sense, all of us, to decide why it is that we're here. And I want to finish, because I want to give Q&A before the time for Isha Salah. And then after the Isha, the, the night prayer, I want us to be able to commune, as they say. You guys all in Texas know what commune means, right? Right? Commune. That means gather together and just enjoy one another's company. There are a couple of things about Islam that I want to clear up very, very simply tonight. Without a shadow, with leaving you with no thought in your, mi no thought in your mind as to any um, ambiguity about these ideas. When you hear about Islam today on the news media, what is one word that you hear associated with Islam more than anything else? For our guests, guests. Al-Qaeda. Al what else? For our guest in the back, I can see you. <laughs> what do you hear about Islam more than anything else? Tell me. Extremists? Terrorism? Terrorism? The big J word, right? What's the big J word called? Jihad. Oh my goodness, I said jihad. There's probably a thousand computers going off at NSA right now. <laughs> And the point that I'm trying to make is that this, I'm going to apologize to you. For I guess I'm going to apologize that we as Muslims have let these words get out of hand. We've let these words get out of hand, jihad. What is another word? It starts with an S that you hear a lot on the news right now. The S is coming. Sharia. Oh no. The boogeyman. It's coming. It's coming. You better watch out. We just heard they're gonna have, pretty soon they're going to have uh, uh, NASA tracking Sharia like they track Santa Claus, where it's going all over the world. These are two words I want to clear up for you tonight. Because I don't want you to leave here thinking, yeah, well, he said this, but they, you know, use these words to muddle the purpose of life in Islam. They really, really act like the, our whole religion is revolved around these ideas, which they are. And I'm going to tell you why they are. The word jihad is not a bad word. It is a beautiful word. And for me to say it is a bad word, I have almost lost my entire religion. I would have lost my entire religion to tell you that jihad means bad, negative, and anything evil. The word jihad is also an Arabic word. It's not jihad. Even though I know that's the Texas translation. It's not jihad. It's called jihad. It also comes from a, 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 a root system. Jahada. What does jahada mean? Come on, you guys from all over the Middle East. Jahada means to make effort. Jahada means to make effort, to struggle. Like if they build a big building, they will say they did juhud. They did juhud on this building. That means they, they, they worked hard to put it up. They did jihad on the building. Now they didn't bring it down, they put it up. <laughs> they didn't bring it down, they put it up. That's still jihad. What does jihad mean in Islam? I'm going to be clear with you. And I'm not going to apologize for anything in Islam. Because Islam needs no apologies. It needs no apologies. I don't, I don't need to do that. And jihad doesn't mean only some struggle that I have with inside of my soul to overcome evil. There is a tent to that in jihad, but that's not the meaning. When you read the word jihad in the book of Allah, the Qur'an, in the Qur'an, the Muslim book, when you read the word jihad, 
Or if you look in the statements of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and you find the word jihad, they have a meaning. And that meaning is a struggle against injustice. A struggle against injustice, no matter where it may be on the earth. A struggle against tyranny, no matter who's the one doing the tyrannizing. A struggle against oppression, no matter who's doing the oppressing. A struggle against evil, no matter where evil may lie on the earth. A struggle to put truth forward. A struggle to make sure that human beings are given a fair shake in life. You ever heard of the Declaration of Independence? That all human beings are created with inalienable rights. And the foremost of those rights are what? Life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. Do you know what that would be called in Islam? Jihad. The struggle to make sure that every human being is given their inalienable right by their Creator to live a life of liberty and the pursuit of happiness is called jihad in Islam. If someone were oppressing another individual, the Prophet, peace be upon him, he said, help your Muslim brother if he is oppressed or if he is an oppressor. The person said, okay, I understand how to help him if he's oppressed. I just stopped the one who was oppressing him. How do you want me to help him if he's oppressor? If he's the one oppressing, what can I do to help him? What did the Prophet, peace be upon him, say? Stop him from his oppression. Stop him from his oppression. If someone is tyrannizing over others, jihad mandates for me to put an end to it. Jihad mandates for me to stop it. If a woman is being abused, if a woman is being abused, jihad mandates that I free her from the abuse. If the rich are usurping the rights of the poor, jihad mandates that I institute a system that makes sure the poor are taken care of and the needy and the weak and the orphans and everyone has their due rights. This is what jihad means. If someone were going to strap a bomb on themselves, walk into a supermarket, and blow themselves up, and I found out about it, jihad would mandate what? I stop him. I stop him, even if I have to take him out myself. I gotta stop him. Does that sound like the jihad that you hear about on CNN? Does that sound like the jihad you hear about on CNN? Fox News, BBC, Time Magazine? I don't, I've never heard that definition come out. But this is what jihad is all about. So to say that jihad equates terrorism is another oxymoron. Because jihad mandates the eradication of terrorism. Yes or no? Anyone raise, come on Muslims, raise your hand if you hear me saying something incorrect. If you hear me saying something incorrect, stop me. Jihad mandates that we end terrorism on the earth. No matter who's doing the terrorizing. For someone to assert the rights of another person, jihad mandates that I stop it. For someone to steal someone's land unjustly, jihad mandates that I put it back in its right place. This is what jihad means. Now, did anyone hear anything about that definition that they think is wrong? That is wrong. Wrong as in an idea that we shouldn't do this. We shouldn't stop people from oppressing others. We shouldn't stop people from tyrannizing others. We shouldn't stop people from harming others, killing others, taking others' wealth without right. Does anyone disagree with that idea? Then you all agree with me that jihad is a good thing. Right? This is why I say that Muslims need to be clear about these things. We need to speak up. We need to stop letting these ideas become taboo. Sharia. Lastly, Sharia. Sharia also comes from a root word. Sharia means what? Boogeyman? No, no boogeyman. Sharia means a way, a path. A path. Linguistically, it means like a path to water. Like a route that's leading to watering or leading to some benefit. A path that leads to some benefit. This is what Sharia means. And Sharia in Islam is defined as a system of rules and regulations and laws that the Creator has designed for creation. That the Creator has, 
designed for his creation so that humanity can fulfill its ultimate role in life to fulfill their purpose and that everyone's rights are taken care of and that everyone is seen to their utmost needs the poor the weak everything we just talked about Sharia mandates the laws and regulations of how to do that of how to do that now let me ask you if you believe in a creator if you believe in a creator, if you believe all of this has a reason and a purpose and a design and you're here for a reason, who do you think is more qualified to make up systems and laws and regulations and rulings and ways of human beings to conduct their affairs? The creator who put it all together in the first place or the creation who is just wandering around on it? Who has the more qualifications? That is a question. The Creator has more qualifications. So what Sharia means in Islam is that I accept that idea. That the Creator, look here, you have more rights to tell me how to do this thing than me. Therefore, I am going to accept what you have to say. The Sharia simply means a way of life, a set rules of systems, of laws, of regulations, of societal norms, of, of, of crime and of punishment, all of these things that are designed not by human beings. No human being came up with any law within the Sharia. They only interpret those laws to fit within culture systems and within times and within different scenarios. But those laws were given to us by the Creator in order for us to help us fulfill our role in life. Because it would also make no sense for the Creator to put us on this earth. Tell us, I want you to worship me. I want you to obey me. I want you to live righteously but then not tell us how to do that. Not give us any guidelines, just figure it out. Because if that were the case, then if I go out and do the wrong thing, I could stand before God and say, look here, you didn't give me any, there was no book, there was no guidelines, there was no, you didn't give me anything to help me, I just figured it out. I made a mistake, it's all right, so be it. No, that logic would lead us to believe that the Creator would give us some guidelines. And all prophets and messengers gave their people guidelines. Moses gave his people guidelines from his creator. Jesus gave his people guidelines. He taught them things. He taught them what they should do. He taught them what they should not do. Not all of that has reached us, but we know he taught things. And as well, we believe the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught things. He taught the purpose of life was to worship the Creator and to fulfill our role of creation in this life. And he gave us a set of system of rules and regulations from the Creator. The difference between the system that was given to us through the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the system that was given to us through Jesus and David and Moses is this. The system that was given to us through Muhammad, we still have every single bit of it. Every single little tiny bit of it. It's in these shelves right here. You see them. The book that is revealed by God and the statements of the Prophet himself. We know everything that he did. We know how he told us to eat. We know how he told us to sleep. We know how he told us to drink. We know how he told us to conduct ourselves with other human beings. We know how he told us to get married. We know how he told us to get divorced. We know how he told us to deal with crimes. We know how he told us to deal with our family relations. We know how he taught us to deal with rulers and governments. Everything is there. There's nothing for us to figure out. It is a complete system. This is what caused Michael Hart, yeah? Michael Hart, when he wrote his book, The Ranking 100, himself as a profession Christian, he wrote in the introduction, I tried with my greatest capacity to put Jesus number one, but justice wouldn't let me do so because Jesus was not a husband. He was not a father. He was not a ruler. His religion didn't become a civilization. Therefore, I had to put no one but Muhammad first. I had to put him as the most influential human in history. And that is all we are simply saying tonight. Is that we believe in one God. And we believe the purpose of our life is to worship that one God. And to live our life according to the laws and regulations that He has given us. And we take that law and ruling and regulations. Yes, we take them from the Prophet Muhammad. But that is not in absence of all the other prophets. We take them also, we believe they're the same rulings that God gave to Jesus. The same rulings that God gave to Moses. Were they tweaked? Yes, they were tweaked. Because the condition of the people of Moses is not like the condition of us. 
the condition of the people of Jesus, not like the condition of us. But in the year 600 CE, humanity was at a place where it could contain information. It could contain information. It could solidify rulings and preserve them for history. The proof is sitting right here on the books of, uh, on these shelves with you today. The proof is sitting in the hearts of a lot of Muslims sitting right here. We've memorized these things by heart for 1400 years. So the proof is in the pudding as they say. That we still have that pure pristine system of life that was given by the Creator to the creation. Yes, the intermediary was Muhammad, but that does not mean that we don't believe in Jesus, we don't believe in Moses, we don't believe in Daisy. No, we believe in every single one of them. And our purpose of life is well defined. And we are here tonight for that reason. All of these Muslims came here tonight to fulfill that purpose. And they get up every morning to fulfill that purpose. And I leave you with one final thought, as they say. It's not really a thought. It's a statement. Being that our purpose for life in Islam is to recognize our Creator and submit our will to Him and live a life according to Him. There's a very beautiful verse I decided to pick from the Qur'an. Very beautiful verse I decided to pick from the Qur'an from many verses in the Qur'an. And it is a verse that comes in chapter 3. And in the Arabic language it is a very, very beautiful verse. Very beautiful verse. But even you will grasp it in the translation of the meaning in English. It says, And to Allah, which Allah means the God. Allah is not the Muslim God. It means the Creator. It means the one who created us. Same God that everyone else who believes in a creator believes in. We believe in the creator and the one who put us here. It says, and to the creator of all that exists belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth. Meaning that he runs that. God runs that. And he is over all things competent. And in, indeed in the creation of the heavens and the earth. And in the alteration of the night and the day are signs for people who reflect. It says indeed in the creation of the heavens and the earth and in the alteration of the night and the day as we see it, these are indeed signs for anyone who can think. Those who remember their Creator while they are standing. Those who remember their Creator while they are sitting. Those who remember their Creator while they are lying down on their sides showing the different postures that we are always in the constant remembrance of the one who created us. And they give thought to the creation of the heavens and the earth and they say something. And this is the statement I give to you tonight. This is my final statement to you. Our Lord, surely you did not create this without purpose. Surely you did not create this without purpose. You are above such an idea. You are above such an idea to create all of this without purpose. So please protect us from the punishment of the blazing fire. That is our final message to humanity. Our Lord, you did not create all of this without purpose. You are far above that. You are far greater than that. So protect us from the punishment of the eternal fire. I thank you very much for your time tonight because I know your time is valuable. No one has a moment in life that they can waste. And I'm adjuring all of you. I'm imploring all of you. Don't waste another moment of your life not knowing where you're going, not knowing what you're doing, not knowing why you're here. Figure it out. Figure it out for yourself. Go sit and think about your own purpose, your own reasoning, your own creation, your own existence and ask yourself why. There has to be a reason. I'm here for a reason. I was born for a reason. I have, my life has meaning. What is that meaning? And that meaning is to give adoration to the one who created me. Because God did not create human beings because He needed company. Let me tell you that right now. He didn't create human beings because He needed company. He didn't create the heavens and the earth because He was bored. God created everything that He created because He had the right to be glorified. He had the right to create things that would glorify Himself. That would magnify His glory. So that we, when we look at them, we could look at them and say, Glory be to the One who created these things.
That is our reason to be here, to glorify the one who put us here. Thank you very much for your time and your patience, and I have been a pleasure being with you and our guest at home. If you want to ask any questions, you can send them over at um, info at onomatv.com, that website that you're on. There's a little button at the bottom that says email us. You can email and it will come directly to me.